strategic is about knowing the conditions and the opportunities to get the best results. For me, the Garden Grove way is really putting kids first in word and action. The Garden Grove way started by building what we did and building a consistency and a pride in what we did. What strategic is, there's many different paths you can go down. All of them may be good, many different ways to get to wherever you're trying to get. Mm -hmm. Strategic is about knowing the conditions and the opportunities um, to leverage um, people, um, situations, sometimes inside the district in this case, sometimes outside, to get the best results that, um, to use your term, are sticky. You've got to know where you want to go, but then thinking very carefully how you're going to get there and what things will help you and what things could um, prevent you from getting there. A lot of our teachers were independent practitioners at that time in a system perhaps not always questioning why things were done the way they were and um, relying on doing things the way they were, had always been done. The community of Garden Grove has changed very much over the last 25 years from kind of a suburban, somewhat farming community through the period of time of having large immigration patterns, students from Mexico, families from Vietnam, so the what wasn't even consistent, the curriculum wasn't consistent. It was time for instructional practice to keep up with the students. An environment without standards, without knowing, kind of like running a race, without knowing where the mile markers are or where the finish line is, but that's the situation when I came in. So it was very helpful actually to have the standards set by the state at that yeah. time and to be able to start figuring out how we were going to start achieving them and helping our kids get better results. We were going to have a uniform, systematic way of approaching what kids needed to know. So part of the buy-in was soliciting people's ideas and thoughts about what was working and what wasn't. One of our biggest challenges was that a school site, let's say a high school, with you know 90 teachers and you may have as many as 15 different understandings of what good instruction looked like. So if we were going to break out of what we call the content box where math teachers were talking to English teachers, we were talking to science teachers about how they taught, not necessarily what the content, we really needed to have that common language. So that was key for us, was developing a common language, a common pedagogical perspective on what effective teaching was. And the idea that if we used a common language and the uh, students became familiar with a common structure and practice, we didn't have to recreate it each time. Each year the students moved to us or each period. And so people, that resonated. They hadn't thought about it like that. It was mm -hmm. more you're taking away my unique style and we were saying, no, we're trying to give consistency that kids can count on from class to class or from year to year, so we're not always having to recreate what we're expecting from the students in terms of responses. And that was very helpful. And actually, in secondary, we uncovered some practices around student placement that, while well-meaning, uh, meant that significant demographic groups within our population weren't being served as well as others. We eliminated some courses because they were confusing the parents, a class like life science that, you know, you would think you send your child to school, life science, that's a good science class. Well, it didn't meet the college entrance requirements. And we also had some great victories because the DNF rate actually went down. And that was the biggest year of growth that we had for the, the CST test, the state assessment that they took in biology, which life science students took as well. That's pretty exciting. And I think our success in working as a board is we approach everything in a very thoughtful manner. We always have put children first, and that tends to mute a lot of the discussions when you have what you would call volatile subjects. And Laura teaches us so well as part of her leadership is thinking about how do we, she would call it salt the oats. So how do we engage the stakeholders in the dialogue about some of these issues that we do need to look at around school reform in a way that's not threatening to them. Yeah. And for example, um, one of the things that we tackled together and had many, many discussions about was grading. We heard predictions like 
police state? Is this a police state that they're gonna tell us how to grade? And But I think when people saw, and this was a group of 65 teachers that was part of this representative group that was creating these guidelines, when they saw the product, how thoughtful it was, and that it wasn't, you know, the Communist Manifesto, there was still room for individual teacher judgment and decisional uh, capital, so to speak. They realized that actually they could trust us through the process of these of these yeah. things that seemed a little scary at first, but that really resulted in greater insight into the the topic. We are very centralized districts, so we feel very strongly that any child that goes to a school, any school in our district deserves the same things. So when we have looked for initiatives that we have seen value in that have been successful, we look at um, you know whether they're scalable and sustainable. And we have a very direct organizational chart. Both Kelly and I oversee the directors of instruction, so there's a consistent message there directly from you know, elementary and secondary education through the directors down to the principals and to the teachers. So that's important to develop that coherence. And I think the transformation that occurred is uh, at the site level when teachers started to be involved through the process. And when teachers began to have a voice, you really allow for a well-aligned system where there's organization, clear goals and expectations, but the work is developed and accepted by the folks in the field. You can see that system well aligned in, in how we establish priorities and then how we execute those at our school sites with our principals. And so we have a lot of communication networks. For the last four years, we've started cultivating demonstration teachers across the district who come in on a regular basis for training and they give us a feedback of how things are going. We also have instituted instructional leadership teams, kind of a professional learning community at half of our 45 elementary schools. And so we are learning from these leaders who are going through protocols during collaboration to prepare for the Common Core. So the demo teacher shows what they're doing to our teachers as well as the teachers at other campuses. And then they assist our instructional leadership team here to, to plan the lessons that are now aligning to the Common Core. It's just this great trickle-down effect. We have a lot of creative ways to make sure they have collaboration time together. And I think the, um, the instructional piece, having a TOSA that's connected to the school, that's kind of the in-between. Teacher on special assignment. Correct, our teacher on yeah. special assignment is assigned to us from the district. Myself and my TOSA work with the district and our director, and so she's this great cohesive piece that brings the district and the schools all together. They do allow the TOSAs will come in and work with um, teachers and they do, like I said, allow teachers to collaborate with each other from even within our school and to other schools in our district. And it's cross-curricular as well. It's not just limited to biology. So we'll meet with all the other inclusion teachers from the district as well. It's really helped us to work together, plan things together, and then reflect on them together. Collaboration, it's coming from the teachers. And so what we do is really that decisional capital where through that collaboration, through the teachers, the teachers see the change that they want to see happen. And so there isn't a decision that the principal, myself, make that hasn't been already vetted out with everybody involved. Well, a lot of it starts with the foundation of purpose, of bringing teachers together to talk about the needs of kids, uh, verifying and confirming what works, uh, identifying groups of kids who need a little additional help, and then bringing the experts, the teachers together to come up with ideas on how to help the kids that need extra help. One of the things about being in Garden Grove as a principal is the support that you receive. Recently with the Common Core coming on, we spent an entire year building the capacity of all of our staff and the why Common Core is occurring rather than just providing the Common Core to the staff and saying here it is. So we really value each other and build that support and capacity to build each other's knowledge. Well, we adopted five years ago a succession plan as part of our board policy. And I think one of the keys to a success in any organization, be it a corporation or a, a public school system, is having good people in place to follow in line when you have a need for somebody to step in. And we really made a selection, or at least began to make the selection process, about 18 months before our superintendent actually retired. So we had opportunities to work together. And we have, by the way, somebody in almost every position that we believe could be someone who could fill in if there was a need. One of the 
kind of tenants around here is we all have an obligation to help those that uh, we lead um, build their capacity to give them opportunities to help everyone get better. If we want teachers to do that for students, then principals should be doing that for teachers. We at the central office should be doing that for principals and the superintendent ought to try to do it for everyone. I think one of the biggest shifts in collaboration has occurred where teachers for a while felt that maybe that was put upon them, but I think the bigger shift came when teachers identified that they want to collaborate. And then when that happened, it really opened the door for us to say, you want collaboration, let's find a way to make it happen for you. We were very surprised last year. We had, um, because as teachers were all learners too, so there were some who thought we can absolutely do this and some who thought, I don't think the kids are ready for it. And by the end of the year, the conversation completely switched. And teachers are very comfortable now with each other. There's no, it's not competitive. I mean, it's competitive in that you want to do your very best, but it's not, you know, like you do one thing in your room and you shut your door. We all work together to refine our craft. We see, I think we've seen, in science anyway, we've seen an indication of higher test scores, more cohesiveness within the department, people willing to share things. We're coming up with common assessments, um, a lot of things that we were not able to see before. We've graduated more students, special education students that are A through G eligible, mm -hmm. which is something we couldn't say a few years back. One of the things that has been a strength um, of our district due to Laura's leadership has been that ability to plan ahead of time over maybe a longer period of time in order to get that uh, sustainability. Well and sometimes in my experience it's been when we get our teacher groups together the excitement they get, the commitment they get to it, what we have to do is then help them see, wait, not everybody else is going to be there so we have to help them understand it's going to take patience to get it throughout the system. And one of the things we talk about is how do you support teachers in being part of that process? And I think one of the key differences is when the standards, how we navigated through those when they first came out, we basically delivered them to teachers one fine day and said, here are the standards you will be teaching, go forth and make lessons. And we were pretty much left on our own as educators. So the good news is with nationalizing the standards and having us adopt it through that process, we now have the time to really look at those instructional shifts and really have our teachers and our administrators be part of the process on what are the standards, what does instruction and good teaching look like in the classroom, and then really build our professional development and our resources around that. And I think through that collaborative effort and, and using the group, if you will, to, to continue those shifts, we know we'll see effective transition to the standards as well as the rigor in the classroom. Now is the time for the schools to say, what are we all about? As a school, what are our priorities? What do we all agree that we're going to do over the next five years as we live through and make the most of this amazing opportunity to implement the Common Core and really transform education? So I think the more that our teachers can have a voice in how they move through that, they'll, they will feel more in control of what they do and empowered. For me, the Garden Grove Way is really exemplifying that commitment to our shared vision that we have to treat every child as if they're our own children that, that we brought up. And uh, that means really having a stewardship, you know, and a servant leadership over yeah. the, the kids in the community that we serve. And that to me is the Garden Grove yeah. way, is really putting kids first in word and action.